Around 5.30 on Sunday, Beverly entered through the front door, tossing her purse and keys onto the side table as she made her way down the hallway to the master bedroom. I wasn't sure if she saw me sitting in the study, but it didn't matter. Over the past few years, I'd become almost invisible to her. I approached and picked up her key ring. I took out the spare keys to my Toyota and then opened her purse. I retrieved her cell phone and wallet. From the wallet, I took out all the cash and credit cards and put the haul into my pocket. Just in case, I grabbed her driver's license too. Then I returned to my spot in the study. Fifteen minutes later, Bev came back into the hall, dressed nicely. Spotting me as she slung her purse over her shoulder and grabbed her keys, she said, Welcome to the Dark Side Channel. Dive into the world of human relationships, mistakes, and right decisions. Don't miss out. Subscribe and join our growing community. I'm going to meet the girls from work. Don't wait up. No, you're not going to meet the girls from work, I countered. Jack. You should know by now that you don't control me. I'll do whatever I damn well please. I didn't say you couldn't meet the girls from work. I said you're not going to meet the girls from work. You're going to see your guy and sleep with him, so don't lie to me anymore. Beverly stood silently for a few seconds. Then she boldly walked into the study and stood in front of me, presenting her ultimatum. Okay, Jack, so you know, I would have preferred to handle this differently, but we might as well end it now. Jack, you have two options. You can salvage what's left of this marriage by accepting my certain freedom, or you can choose to have me divorce you and erase you from my life. What will it be? Hmm, I choose door number three, I replied with a smirk. Don't be childish, there is no door number three. Either accept that I now have a lover, a real man for a change, or prepare for the consequences, and I do mean your suffering. I stood up, grabbed Bev by the shoulders, and pressed her against the wall. I removed the wedding and engagement rings from her left hand. With my lips inches from her face and a dead look in my eyes, I whispered fiercely to her. Oh, there's door number three. Look, it's right over there. It's my front door, and when you walk through it, it'll be for the last time. You leave with the clothes on your back and never cross this threshold again. You won't get another cent from my money. In the end, You'll lose your husband, your daughter, your home, your money, your car, and your job. You're living in a fantasy world, Jack. She muttered nervously. My lawyer will tear you apart. Tomorrow, I'll send divorce papers to your workplace. If you cause me pain, you'll suffer much more than me. I wrenched her shoulders from the wall and frog-marched her to the front door as she stumbled in her high heels. She screamed incoherently as I shoved her out the door. Beverly could barely keep her balance, her composure completely gone. In all the years of our marriage, I had never laid a hand on her, and she didn't know how to react. Standing in the yard outside the house, she began to regain her senses, and at that moment, I closed the door and locked it, a lock I had replaced earlier that day. As Beverly left, I made the first of two phone calls. I dialed my 19-year-old daughter's college number. Sweetheart, it's Dad. Things with your mother have finally reached a breaking point. She's likely moving in with her boyfriend, and I wanted to talk to you first. I want you to know that I have recorded our last conversation with your mother, along with hours and hours of previous arguments. They're available for you to listen to, so please remember you have access to the truth when she tries to spin things and blame me. And she will try. Darling, the truth is, your mother is having an affair. I don't know how many times she's been with other men, but this time she's found someone she's willing to leave our family for. As I'll explain to you soon, this likely means her boyfriend is quite dangerous, so be very careful in your interactions with your mother. Next, I asked Patty if she could come home for the weekend so we could talk, and she could listen to the recordings if she wanted. Patty agreed to come home on Friday. My next call was to Martha, our neighbor at the end of the block. Martha was a widow in her early thirties. Martha, it's Jack. If the offer is still on the table, I'd like to take you up on it. Could you come over in about an hour or so? I hate long stories of troubled marriages, so I'll keep this one fairly short. Beverly and I met and married around the age of twenty, and we had a daughter, Patty. For a couple of years, everything was fine, but feelings seemed to fade quickly for Bev. 
As events unfolded, she became more and more argumentative. She turned into a quarrelsome, manipulative, and controlling person. I tried my hardest to bite my tongue and make things better for her, but it seemed the more I tried, the worse it got. Indeed, now I believe I contributed to my own suffering by trying to appease Bev all these years. I regret not handling things differently and taking control of her and the situation from the start. So now, in our early forties, everything has gone completely sideways. When I suspected Bev and conducted a little investigation, I quickly learned about her boyfriend, and the results were astonishing. She had gotten involved with a former convict with a reputation for violence against women. I don't think Bev initially knew about this, but her lover had at least two other women on the hook when Bev came along. This guy's name is Sylvester, and he's known as Sly, of course. I was shocked to learn about him, but in a way it also made sense to me. So when I realized our marriage was truly over, I felt immense relief, and I began to plan. I read stories where the aggrieved husband takes half the money. Not me. I took every damn penny I could get my hands on, including all the cash I could find in the house. I changed the locks, of course, and I had plans to infuriate Bev as much as possible. You see, my marriage taught me a lot about how she reacts, and I planned to use her volatility against her. She was a dangerous woman in many ways, but this time she would be dangerous to herself as well. Actually, my planning started long before I learned about her lover in the end. For years, I recorded us every time we argued. She thought the device I always carried was just a simple MP3 player, but in reality, I was creating a library of her antics for documentation. I knew no one would believe my stories without evidence, as she only harassed me like this when we were alone. Around other people, including our daughter, she was sweet as pie. I wanted to be able to tell everyone about her, including all our friends and family. On Monday after our Sunday showdown, I threw a party in the company break room. Hanging overhead was a big banner that read, Happy Divorce. I had cake and ice cream ready, and I eagerly awaited the arrival of the tech server. Lucky for me, it turned out to be a chubby girl doing the dirty work. Many photos were taken as my colleagues and I celebrated the handing over of the divorce papers. I posed for a photo, holding the papers and kissing the server girl on the cheek. She wore a festive pointed hat at the time. In another photo, I shoved a forkful of cake into her mouth and we both smiled. When the party was over, I emailed the photos to Bev. Along with the party photos, I sent a couple of pictures of myself and Martha, my neighbor, in my bed with the sheets pulled up to our necks, wide smiles on our faces. I hoped Bev would notice her wedding rings on Martha's left hand, resting on my chest. An hour later, I received an angry phone call. You bastard! My lawyer will devour you for lunch after these photos. What a dumbass you are! Doubtful Bev. There's nothing indecent or compromising in these shots. No nudity. Just two neighbors decided to have some fun. Just playful pictures, that's all. We'll see about that. Jack, I'll come home tonight to pick up some of my things. I think it would be better if you weren't there. If I'm not there, you won't be able to get in. All the locks have been changed. If you need anything, you better be there well before 6.45. Marta and I have a date at 7, and damn sure I don't want to be late. Last night I got the best piece I've ever had, and tonight will be even better. Then I hung up and didn't answer when she called back five times. Even though I hadn't been answering all her calls since then, I listened to all the messages. Unlike other guys I'd read about in similar circumstances, there was a good chance Bev would say something compromising or accidentally reveal a secret when she called in anger. Indeed, she did slip up several times in the following weeks. At 4.30 that same day, I drove to Bev's workplace parking lot. I wanted to get there before people started leaving for home. I made sure there were no surveillance cameras in the parking lot, and what I was about to do would take less than a minute. I parked next to Bev's car, and circling around it, I snipped the valve stems on all her tires with wire cutters. Oh yes, she would definitely be enraged. Plus, she'd never get them fixed in time to make it home by 6.45. But it was around 6.35 when she showed up. Obviously, she had been out with someone, so I knew she desperately wanted to get into the house. After all, I had seen receipts for clothes she bought, which, as I knew, she didn't bring home. 
So there must have been plenty of her lover's clothes in the house. She must be wanting something else. I slipped out the back door and hurried to Martha's house, leaving Bev banging on the front door and yelling. When I returned that evening, my front door window was smashed and there was blood around it. Reviewing the surveillance camera footage from the front porch, I called the police. On the video, Bev was seen hitting the window with a tire iron, evidently taken from her friend's car. It was clear she threatened to kill me as she smashed the glass and crawled inside. Unfortunately for her, the lock I installed was one of those that required a key from both sides to open. When she withdrew her hand, she cut her forearm pretty badly, prompting another round of screams and threats from her. I immediately reported the incident to the police, and one of the officers kindly guided me through the process of filing a protection order. The next morning, Bev was served papers prohibiting her from coming within 150 meters of me or our home. To say she was furious would be an understatement. What the hell are you doing, you idiot? That's how her next phone call started. She was furious and once again threatening me. I recorded the entire conversation. A few hours later, somewhat calmed down, she called again. She said she would send her friend Lindsay that evening to pick up some of her things. What does she desperately want from the house? I wondered. So I agreed to meet Lindsay at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday. I left work a little early to set up a video camera in my bedroom with a monitor in the office. Lindsay arrived on time and I was very courteous. I sat on the bed while she packed some clothes into two black plastic trash bags. Lindsay nervously glanced at me, then asked if I could bring her some water from the kitchen. I smiled and left. As soon as I looked at the monitor, I saw Lindsay pull out a shoebox from the closet into the nearest bag. Then she returned to picking out clothes. I quickly grabbed a glass of water from the kitchen and returned to the bedroom. I think this is enough, she said. Could you take this bag and I'll take the other? Oh, this one looks heavier, Lindsay. Let me take it. Um, no, I'm okay. Just take the other one, okay? Is there something in this bag I should know about, Lindsay? I asked as she started fidgeting and dragging her bag towards the door. I grabbed her wrist and opened the bag. It's just clothes and stuff that Bev needs, she said anxiously. Are you a bad liar, Lynn? What's in this shoebox I feel here? Don't you want to tell me about it? I pulled out the box from under the shoes and opened it. The box was stuffed with bundles of dollar fifty and dollar one hundred bills, all looking worn. Lindsay, you're trying to rob me. I stood up and pulled her arm behind her, leading her towards the door and down the hallway. Jack, this is Bev's money. She sent me here to get it. I'm not stealing anything. Well, you came into my house for clothes, and I caught you leaving with a box of money. I call that theft. I don't see Bev's name on this box. You're a thief, Lindsay. I'm calling the police. Right now. Get ready to be arrested for robbery. No, Jack. Don't do this. I can't go to jail. I have kids and a husband, for heaven's sake. I sat Lindsay down on the couch and looked her straight in the eyes. Lindsay, you will never be welcome in this house again. I thought you were my friend, but now I know you're a thief. She continued to beg me and started crying. If you want to redeem yourself, you have one chance. You will leave this house and tell Bev that I caught you stealing. Then you will report to me everything you hear or see, especially anything related to our divorce or her relationship with Slay. You won't tell her about our arrangement. Bev made a really bad decision getting involved with that loser, and ultimately, you'll help her get away from him if you cooperate with me. And Lindsay, I have the whole episode on video, and I can call the police and file a report against you at any time. Reluctantly, Lindsay agreed to be my informant. Once she left, I took the box of money and went to Martha's house at the end of the block. She agreed to hide it from me until I could securely stash it away where Bev would never find it. I knew where the money likely came from. Aunt Bev's Mabel was notoriously stingy, and when she passed away a few months ago, Bev was her sole heir. I knew her aunt left her a small cabin in the countryside, but nothing was ever said about money. Obviously, when Bev inspected the cabin after the will was read, she found her aunt's hidden stash of money. When my adulterous wife called and yelled, I recorded the conversation, but I was careful about what I said. These are my damn money, Jack. I want my damn money. Bev, I don't understand what you're talking about. I caught Lindsay trying to steal money from my nightstand. It's my money. 
you damn well know what I'm talking about. The money in the shoebox, and it's mine. It's from Aunt Mabel. I inherited it. Well, maybe Lindsay did find some money in the shoebox. But if she did, she must have taken it with her and kept it for herself. I don't have it. Maybe Lindsay stole it from you. And if you had any money here that I didn't know about, you didn't report it when you filed your taxes last year. I know because I read and signed the tax returns. You can call the police to investigate, and then we'll report to the tax authorities about this money and let them decide what to do about your tax evasion. She hung up. There had to be some revenge. I knew it. I pressed Bev's buttons too hard for there not to be. She couldn't risk getting caught near the house because of the restraining order. Since I started by vandalizing her car, I thought she might try to retaliate through mine. So I had a camera installed on the dashboard, but that wasn't enough. I wanted good shots of her doing her thing if she decided to go down that path. So, when I parked in front of the garage on Wednesday morning, I set up a camera outside the house, hidden from prying eyes. This camera transmitted video that I could watch from my desk. An hour before noon, I watched on my laptop as Bev parked her car behind mine, got out, and started hammering away at my car with a hammer. She smashed all the windows and dented every fender. I winced a little when the camera caught her smashing the windshield and yelling, That's how I'll bash your head in! I dialed 911, and the police were already waiting for her as she pulled out of the driveway. When I showed them the video and my wrecked Toyota, they handcuffed Bev and took her to jail. It was clear she had caused enough damage to qualify it as a criminal offense. The resisting arrest charge was just the icing on the cake. She turned to look at me with a pleading look as they took her away, but I just stared at her silently. Bev's divorce lawyer called me on Wednesday to inform me that there would be a hearing in court regarding access to the money I withdrew from our joint accounts. It was scheduled for Thursday at 10 a.m. I was in the courtroom at 9.50, wondering if Bev had made bail. She and her lawyer arrived right on time, with a smug look on her face. Bev's lawyer addressed the judge. Your Honor, my client has been cut off from the bank accounts she shared with her husband. He unlawfully withdrew all the money after she filed for divorce. At this moment, we are requesting the court to divide it fifty. Fifty. Mr. Reynolds, do you have anything to say? Yes, Your Honor. My unfaithful wife has plenty of her own funds that she has been withdrawing from our joint accounts for months. The money I withdrew was reasonable compensation, as I'm responsible for paying rent and bills. She abandoned our marriage and moved in with the man she's cheating on me with. Bev stood up. That's a lie. He took all the money from our savings and checking. He didn't leave me a cent. I have nothing. Bev's lawyer took her hand and sat her back down. They had a brief conference while I handed documents to the judge. Your Honor, these are bank statements from last year. You'll notice that amounts up until a few months ago, including Bev's salary, are highlighted in yellow. Additionally, there are periodic bonuses highlighted in orange. Then, about six months ago, her checks stopped going into our joint account, and her bonuses vanished too. I have a recording of my conversation with her HR department, if you'd like to hear it, confirming that her direct deposit was changed to her personal account. The total amount transferred from our joint account amounts to thousands of dollars, Your Honor. It's abundantly clear that my unfaithful wife has enough funds and they've all been stolen from our marriage. The judge reviewed the bank statements, then peered over his glasses at Beverly. You have anything to say about this, Miss Reynolds? Bev's lawyer rose slowly and spoke. Your Honor, the fact that my client may have her own funds does not absolve Mr. Reynolds of the responsibility to give her her share. Well, Counselor, I don't like being lied to. Miss Reynolds claimed she was destitute, which, as I've learned, was nonsense when she came in here with a fancy guy like you in a tow truck. Now we see that she's sufficiently funded by money that should have been marital property, and she tried to deceive both her husband and the court on this matter. Since Mr. Reynolds is paying bills from his own funds, I see no reason to change any financial arrangements at this time. When the divorce agreement is finalized, the property will be declared and divided accordingly. Case closed. Bev caught up with me in the hallway as I was leaving. I started recording as she spoke. I'll get you, you bastard. I'm going to tear you apart. Bev, you're not supposed to be within 150 meters of me. 
I'll call the police if you don't move. By the way, how did you like jail? Are you ready to spend a lot more time there? You've been charged with a criminal offense. I could say she tried to lunge at me, but I just kept moving down the corridor towards the door, and she stood there, clenching her fist with a distorted and red face. That evening, I went to the local bar. Not my usual hangout, but it was where I met an interesting guy a month ago. The reason this guy was interesting was because he had a crappy car. Luckily, Zeke was there, on his usual bar stool. Hey dude, I remember you. Remind me, what's your name again? Doesn't matter, Zeke. Hey, do you still have that crappy car? Oh man, yeah, I hate that thing. Wife took the nice one when she ran off with that suit-wearing jerk. AC's busted and I'm dying in this heat. No money for a new car, and it's the only way I can get around. She took all the cash, and I got bad credit. You got car insurance, right? If you do what I tell you, I might be able to help you get something better. I'm all ears, buddy. Suppose you're driving, say, down 38th Street, and suddenly a gray cat darts out in front of you. Naturally, you hit the brakes. And maybe the lady behind you, following too closely, plows into the rear of your crappy car. At speeds over 15 miles an hour, your car's gonna be totaled. If your head's against the headrest, and you're strapped in with your seatbelt, you'll be fine. Insurance covers your losses, and you could at least get a car with AC. Yeah. But what if the lady who hits me gets hurt? I can't do that to some poor woman. Well, I can guarantee you that this lady will be a cheating whore, and there'll be no one else in the car if you follow my instructions. What do you say to that? Oh man, that'd be great. I hate deceiving bastards, and I definitely need to get rid of this car. Park it at the corner of 38th and Lessing tomorrow by 5 p.m. Look left. And when you see the blue car pulling out of the parking lot and heading your way, you can pull out in front of her. She doesn't like passing other cars, so just drive a block or so until she's on your tail. Then, you'll kind of see a cat darting across the road, so be ready and slam on the brakes hard. Just stay in the car afterward, dial 911, and tell the EMTs that you think you might have a neck injury. And by the way, I never met you. I'll never be in this bar again, and we don't know each other. Dude, I owe you. Not as much as you'll owe to the air conditioning in your new car. On Friday, I left work early to meet with my daughter at home. She finished her classes and came home as we agreed on Sunday evening. We talked a bit about the divorce situation, and I played her the recording of the conversation I had with her mother about door number three. Patty was shocked to hear her mother's callous tone and demands. Then I played Patty a compilation of recordings I had made over the past two years, and she heard the side of Bev that she never suspected existed. What do you know about this guy she's with, Dad? I know he's a really bad person, and I want you to stay away from him. If you ever need to meet your mom, make sure you're in a public place where there are people. I don't know what he might do to try to get to me through you. Anyway, always have something for your protection, if there's even a slight chance he might be around. Dad, I knew you and Mom had some issues, but I never realized how bad it all was. What the hell happened to you guys? That was a question I was prepared for, and I launched into a long monologue explaining my perspective on things. Here's a slightly shorter version. Patty, as far as I understand now, your mother and I had completely different ideas about what marriage should be like. I've thought a lot about it, and I have a theory. Someone probably already thought about what I'm about to explain to you and wrote it all down in a book, but this idea came to me independently. There are four main ways power is distributed in relationships. Sometimes, neither party takes control, and in that case, everything just drifts like a ship without a rudder. It's also possible for both partners to take responsibility. In this case, they might constantly argue about who's in charge, or perhaps they divide things so each person controls certain aspects of the relationship. They might even split responsibility equally. That's what I expected when I entered into the relationship. But it turned out very differently. Another way this can happen is if the man is in charge. This can work under certain conditions. I know we consider patriarchal relationships offensive and demeaning to women nowadays. But if a man is completely devoted to his wife, it can be like Snow White and her Prince Charming. It can be a fairy tale life for a wife with the right temperament. 
She can live without worrying about making tough decisions, confident that her man will always take care of her. Or it could be like your maternal grandparents. You know how your grandma was always gentle as a mouse and your grandpa was dominant, sometimes even harsh. That's what your mom saw growing up, and I think that's what she expected in our relationship. So when I tried to share the top spot with her, she started to see me as weak. The more I tried to please her, the less she respected me. This brings me to the last possibility. Relationships where the wife dominates. I think your mom decided to be the boss when I couldn't live up to her image of a good person. She started treating me harshly. She decided which projects would get done, and it was best if they were done to her satisfaction. I can't tell you how many times she'd start a family project, then stand over me, dictating exactly how I should do it. It's about as many times as projects that never got finished because I couldn't stand feeling like a belittled husband in my own home. She literally told me how to hold a hammer or a screwdriver when I was building or fixing something. It was utterly unbearable. You see, when the wife dominates, in most cases, there's something that goes against human nature. I don't understand how that type of relationship can work. A husband can be dominant and still maintain love and attachment to his wife, but a wife loses respect for any man she dominates. I think that's what's happening with us. When I started to understand how things were and began to resist, Beverly didn't see it as me taking responsibility. By that time, she already saw me as a weakling, and when I refused to let her boss me around, she simply saw me as an unruly child. I'll never be able to earn her respect back. I think this divorce process is my last chance to win her respect. So you'll understand my actions when you see how hard it is for me to prove my intolerance to this way of life to her. Patty, you'll soon find someone as a life partner. When you decide on things like having kids, what job to take and where to live, think about how you're going to make decisions. Make sure you and your partner know what to expect and ensure there's mutual respect between you. Otherwise, you'll both be unhappy and could end up in the situation your mom and I found ourselves in. I will, Dad, I promise. Shortly after, the phone rang. Mr. Reynolds, this is Memorial Hospital. Your wife has been in a car accident. She's stable and not too badly hurt, but she'll be with us at least overnight. Patty and I went to the hospital, and I let her go into the room first. Patty didn't stay long, and I asked for permission to speak to Bev alone when she came out looking grim. I suspected Patty had some harsh words for her. Gee, you look like crap, Bev, I said with a slight smirk. What a crappy week for you, huh? First, you lose your marriage, husband, and home. Then you get served with a restraining order, and then arrested for a criminal offense. Then you lose some of the money you were counting on. Now your car is wrecked, and you're lying in the hospital with a broken wrist and a face smashed by an airbag. I guess this divorce is turning out better for me. Screw you, she replied. Yeah, Bev. Where's old Slade? Hasn't he come to visit yet? Don't worry. He's probably off sleeping with one of his other two women right now. She paled. You probably didn't know about the others when you started all this, did you? Looks like you do now. Wonder how long it'll be before he wants you to serve one of them. I never thought of you as a man-eater, but it's probably a good skill to learn, considering how much you'll need it in prison. I'm not going to prison. My lawyer will get these bogus charges dropped. Really? You kind of smashed up my car and threatened my health, it seems. Because when I talked to the district attorney, he hinted at throwing you in there. He's got photographic evidence, and he's got elections coming up. Right now, he wants to look tough on crime. I think he'll ask for the maximum. She just sat there staring at me. By the way, which car insurance company did you decide to go with? I asked. Car insurance? What do you mean? We still have the same old... Are you saying you didn't get yourself insurance this week? When you filed for divorce, I took your car off the insurance. You do know about that, right? I mean, you insisted your car be solely in your name, so it's your responsibility now. Honey, if you didn't get insurance this week, you're really screwed. You'll have to pay a couple of fines, towing expenses, and three years of payments. Maybe you won't be able to afford it, and that car will just sit in some junkyard corner forever while you're still paying for it. But you might not need another car as you won't have a job after you're convicted of a serious crime. Plus, the guy you hit might have medical bills, 
and his insurance company will be coming after you for damages. Damn. But at least you've got your own health insurance, right? I'm on your... No, no. I dropped you from my health insurance on Monday. You didn't change that either. Sweetheart, you screwed up. Ambulance ride, ER visit, x-rays, doctors, cast on your right arm, hospital stay, follow-up care. It's gonna cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. Hey, speaking of health, the other day I was thinking about when you got sick a couple of years ago. Remember, I took a week off to take care of you. I held your head while you were throwing up, and I cleaned up when you didn't make it to the bathroom in time. I called the doctor and went to the pharmacy to get you medicine. When you felt better a week later, you went back to cursing me, insulting me, and calling me all sorts of names. I wonder how well old Slade will take care of you next time you get sick. Well, I gotta go. Call Slade when you decide he's done with his other hooker. Wish you a good life. Bev just sat there and cried as I left. I didn't care. After that, things went on for a while. Nothing special happened. Occasionally, I'd reach out to Lindsay. She was starting to worry about Slade's control over Bev, and over time, Lindsay distanced herself from her. Then one evening, as I returned home and headed towards my front door, I was attacked on the lawn. I was pretty cautious about potential attacks, but I didn't anticipate this. A guy in a ski mask knocked the wind out of me and twisted my arm behind my back. He yelled in my ear that I had to hand over the money box and tell the district attorney to drop the charges. I was stunned and couldn't defend myself. Nevertheless, I still had the car alarm remote in my hand, so I pressed the panic button and it went off. Slade got angry and hit me again. Then he jumped up and quickly ran away when the neighbor's porch lights came on and people started peeking out. I yelled for them to call 911, and a police officer showed up within minutes. I wasn't injured badly enough for an ambulance ride, and Slade was long gone. None of my neighbors said they could recognize him, so the assault was left unresolved. An even bigger shock came when I called my daughter and told her about it the next day. Dad, I didn't want to tell you, but I had a run-in with Slade too. Mom called me to talk. I told her we could talk but away from his apartment. She asked me to pick her up, but when I got there, she sat me down on their couch. Then Slade came out and talked to me. He said since Mom wasn't performing very well in bed with her injuries, I'd have to satisfy his needs instead. He said she owed him, and I'd be paying off for her. I looked at Mom, and she just stared at the floor and said nothing. Slade said, Tell her to do it. Mom looked at me and said, Please, honey, just go along with him. It won't be that bad, and I really need you to do this for me. Then he came over to me and grabbed my wrist to make me stand up. My right hand was on the pepper spray in my purse, and when he dragged me, I sprayed him in the face. He yelled and grabbed his face, and I grabbed my purse and tried to pull Mom out the door, but she recoiled and went towards him. I yelled at her to come with me, but she was helping him in the bathroom, so I left. I can't believe my own mother tried to push me towards that bastard. I don't know if I'll ever forgive her for that. I was boiling, like any father in my position would be. I thought about my Beretta in the bedroom and almost went for it. After a while, my daughter calmed me down, saying she wasn't hurt, and advised me to think about the future. I made a pact with Patty not to walk alone until the trial was over, and always carry protection. She said she'd only date other students and never be alone in public, so I gradually got myself together. Slade told me to talk to the district attorney, but he didn't expect the conversation I actually had. I played back the recording of my daughter's account of Slade and reminded him that Slade had attacked me. Okay, so the district attorney asked if I wanted to go easy on Bev or maybe drop the charges. Absolutely not. I want you to press charges to the fullest extent. Bev is under the control of that snake, and the only way I see to help her is to get her away from him. A few months in jail might straighten her out. The district attorney agreed, and the trial continued. I felt pretty confident at home and at work, but there were times when I felt vulnerable. When I pulled into or out of the garage, I was exposed to attacks, but I was very careful on my way to and from work. Our house is located about ten miles down the road towards the ranch, for about 15 miles, it's the only turnoff from this road. The only other thing out there is a series of big ranches with gated entrances. 
so I was very aware of other trouble spots on this long road home. I always carried my Beretta with me. One evening, a few days before Bev's trial was supposed to start, I saw the headlights of a pickup truck behind me, about two miles down the road towards home, and I got goosebumps. Soon it was twenty feet behind my rear bumper, going fifty-five miles per hour. I dialed 911 on my phone and hit record on my little dictaphone. As I sped up to 70, the pickup stayed with me. I gave a quick commentary to the 911 operator, asking her to call the detective investigating my assault. The pickup maintained pressure for another five miles as I feverishly narrated to the operator what was happening. The gun lay on the seat next to me, and I took it off safety. I realized there was a bridge ahead, spanning a small creek with old-fashioned concrete railings. I guessed that Slade, or whoever was driving the truck, would make his move to push me off the road there. About a hundred yards before the bridge, the pickup accelerated, and I knew he'd try to ram me off the road. I caught a glimpse of Bev's face in the passenger seat of the pickup as it pulled up alongside me. I hit the brakes hard enough to send the car into a slide but not so hard that I'd lose control as it turned out. The truck stopped in front of me, but it missed my front bumper due to my braking. My car skidded sideways onto the shoulder and stopped. Its rear end was on a slope leading down to the creek bed. I got out, grabbed the gun, phone, and dictaphone, and headed down the steep gravel slope under the bridge. As I descended, I saw the pickup's taillights come on. I stumbled in the darkness, feeling my way under the bridge. It was a great way to meet a rattlesnake basking on warm ground. But it wasn't the snake I was worried about at that moment. I was breathing heavily, trying to find the safest place to hide. Finally, I stopped and cocked the trigger on the Beretta. I waited, but for a while I heard nothing. The mobile phone connection to 911 cut out. I tried to redial in the darkness, but being under the bridge wasn't the best place for getting a signal. I was stuck, and I had no idea if help was on the way. At least I didn't hear the pickup's engine roar above. I wasn't going to move. I told myself I'd spend the night there if need be. It seemed like an eternity, but probably only five or ten minutes passed before I heard sirens in the distance, coming from the same direction as me. If they were so far behind, they'd never catch the pickup. The police car had obviously stopped when they saw my car on the shoulder, and I began climbing up the slope, leaving the Beretta under the bridge. I raised my hands and asked them not to shoot. As I approached the road, I saw there were two cars blocking both lanes. Around the same time, I heard sirens from the other side and saw the pickup returning to the bridge. I collapsed into the mud. From the ground, I could hardly make out anything, but I heard the pickup screech to a halt and officers yelled at the driver to get out and down on the ground. Other police cars following the pickup stopped behind it. Soon it was all over. Bev and Snake Slade were in custody, charged with attempted murder. I was greatly shaken, but I went home, took a shower, and tried in vain to sleep. Divorce seems very straightforward when your spouse is facing multiple criminal charges. I received a lot of sympathy from the judge and no resistance from Bev or her worn-out lawyer. Bev desperately wanted to spend as little time in prison as possible. She offered through her lawyer to give me practically everything in the divorce in exchange for any help I could provide in mitigating her sentence. During the sentencing hearing, I testified that she had been a good wife and mother until she fell under Slade's influence. I told the judge that over time, I could forgive her for attempting to kill me. I forgot to mention that she almost certainly cheated on me with other men and turned my life into hell over the years. I couldn't read her expression in the courtroom, and I never spoke to her directly during this time. In the end, Slade got a long stint in prison. It wasn't his first offense. I sincerely hope he's in a cell with a big sweaty guy named Bubba who thinks he's as sweet as candy. The judge was kinder to Bev, but she won't be eligible for parole for at least three years. So it's been about four years since Bev got locked up. I heard from the DA's office that she got out on parole about a year ago. I've been waiting to hear from her. I know she hasn't been in touch with Patty. Revenge is big and all, but not as big as you'd expect. I found myself unable to stop thinking about everything that happened, 
so I did something unexpected. I called my ex-wife. Bev, it's Jack. I've got something of yours and I want to give it back. I called the rehab center where Bev was staying now. For a few seconds I wasn't sure if she could hear me. There was no response. Bev, I want to give you a shoebox. Can you hear me? Can we meet somewhere so I can give it to you? I thought she might hang up, but eventually she spoke. Where? When? I don't care. We can meet somewhere neutral, like a restaurant, or you can come to my place. Whatever you want. Maybe Sunday. Are you free Sunday? She hesitated a bit more. I'll be there Sunday at two. Phone cut out. As I prepared to meet my ex-wife, the mother of my child, the woman who tried to kill me and a convicted felon, I made lemonade and cookies. I opened the door for Bev, and neither of us even attempted to shake hands, let alone hug. We just exchanged greetings, and I gestured for her to come into the study. Her hair was much shorter than before, and her gaze was stern. There wasn't as much makeup on her, if any at all. Now she was fifty, but she looked sixty-five. On the coffee table were drinks, cookies, and the shoebox. She sat across from the couch, and I offered her a drink, which she declined. Did she suspect I was trying to poison her? All right. If you don't want the lemonade and cookies, I guess the only thing you need is the shoebox and whatever else we might have to say to each other. What's the catch, Jack? What do you want in return? Is there anything left in it? She still eyed me very suspiciously. No catch, Bev. Everything's in there, except for a few thousand that I put together with the same amount of my own money and gave to Patty when she got married as a down payment for her house. If you want, she'll gladly start paying you back whenever it's convenient for you. I just gave her my share. From Bev's expression, I could tell she didn't know Patty was married. Patty's been married for two years now, and you're already a grandma. I could see the tension in her eyes, knowing she was struggling with her emotions. She named the little girl Shannon Beverly Evans. Shannon is her other grandma's name. Tears filled Bev's eyes despite all her efforts. Bev, I know you haven't been in touch with Patty for a while. There must be a way for you two to reconnect. If you want, I can pave the way. Beverly nodded, tears now streaming down her cheeks. I reached for the side table for a box of tissues I'd placed there. So, I'll give you the short version of what's been going on with us, in case you don't want to leave right away. She wiped the tears from her cheeks and tried to compose herself. Patty found a great guy. His name's Stan Evans. He's into computers and networks. Seems like they really hit it off. She's a great mom, and they're so devoted to each other. Marta and I lasted only a few months. She's too young for me, and I was just a temporary fix for her until she could get her life together. She found another guy and left. I date some, but I cut things off if it seems like there's any emotional attachment forming. I'm better off alone. I'll stay a bachelor. There was silence for a while. Now I'm gonna say some things that are just for my benefit. But you might get something out of it too. I hope you do. I couldn't wait to see you in jail. I hated you and wished you dead many times. And then when they locked you up, my feelings started to change. I found I couldn't enjoy my victory when it was all said and done. So I stopped hating you. Even though you never asked for it, I forgave you. It's because I know you're not 100% to blame. I couldn't understand you until it was too late, and we stopped talking to each other. We just argued. Beverly composed herself and looked up from the floor. She gave me a lost look but said nothing. That's really it, short and clear. If you have nothing to say to me, and if you don't want to have a snack, I won't keep you any longer. You probably have important things to do. She stood up and grabbed the box. As she headed towards the front door, for the first time since I pushed her out many years ago, I called out to her, Bev, it doesn't matter anymore, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'm curious. All the time we were together, and especially on that last day when you were here, it was obvious you thought I was weak. Do you still think I'm weak, Bev? She paused, hand on the doorknob, and looked back at me. I hate you. You're cruel, and you ruin my life. She paused. But I don't think you're weak. And then she vanished from my life forever.